Travis McMichael, Greg McMichael, and William Roddy Bryant, case number CR200433. The court issued ultimately an amended notice of hearing for today's date and tomorrow's date. Uh, the idea of being set aside two days just in case we needed two days. I'm not suggesting everybody fill all of that time, but just in case we needed two days to hear matters. The uh, notice of hearing set forth uh, 12 matters the court intended to hear today. There are a couple other motions that are out there which we can touch on at some point during the proceedings just to see whether or not we need to have evidentiary hearings on those matters or whether they can uh, be addressed pre-trial. I would say that there is a trial notice that the court has issued to be in jury selection October 18th uh, and there may be some time to hear some matters obviously at that. Uh, once jury selection has been completed and before the trial of the case. A couple uh, matters before we get started. First, uh, with microphones, what I've been told uh, here in Glen County is the gooseneck mics uh, go into the system. Um, there are not gooseneck mics over on the council table um, to my right. Uh, I can probably hear you. Uh, there is a mic that goes into the system at the podium that you can use. Uh, let's just sort of start working through it and see whether or not that is or is not an issue. If anybody has a problem hearing somebody that's not on the mic, please let me know. We'll just go ahead and get that addressed. Uh, also, uh, I just want to make sure with uh, cell phones, um, it's my understanding the policy here in Glen County is that if you have a cell phone, you can't take it out in the courtroom. Uh, I'm going to have everybody in the courtroom adhere to that policy. Before we get into the actual motions themselves, let me just go ahead and get announcements. Uh, anything preliminary from the state? Nothing from the state, Your Honor. Um, from uh, Travis? No, Your Honor, just looking for some direction of where you want to begin. And if we can help inform you a little bit about what we're doing today, then we're happy to do that. Yeah. Uh, from Gregory, take a look. No issues preliminarily except as if you were to do what Mr. Sheffield suggested, we have some matters that we've already agreed upon, and that may help you understand what's going to be litigated today. Thank you. I think it would be helpful to kind of have like a calendar call for motions this morning uh, to figure out uh, the exact order we're going in and, and make announcements. Sure. So I have, um, I've got 12 matters on the notice of hearing. Uh, one of them, I understand, has been withdrawn, and that, let's just go ahead and address that right out. There was a immunity motion filed by Mr. Bryan that was withdrawn on May 5th, uh, formally through a, um, a notice to the court, so that matter's not before the court. That's correct. So the remaining items I have then are the 11 on the notice of hearing. Uh, if some matters have been resolved, <coughs> Go ahead and get that on the record and then order what remains. So, uh, yeah, our number two motion to adopt co defendants' objections. Uh, the state filed a very nice response and it persuaded me, so we're withdrawing that motion. 
Your Honor, with respect to... Oh, hold on just a second. So that is the motion to adopt co-defendant's objections filed December 3rd that has been withdrawn. And that's withdrawn on behalf of both Travis McMichael and Greg McMichael. That's correct, Your Honor. Okay. And also, we, we're also withdrawing the motion we joined on. All right. Any other motions being withdrawn? <laughs> it is my understanding, Your Honor, after some discussions with the state, that number four, the state's notice of intent to introduce evidence of other acts, 404B, against defendant Greg McMichael, has been with, agreed upon that that issue would not be introduced in the defendant's case in chief. Oh, excuse me, I misspoke. That that information, the state would not intend to introduce in their case in chief. However, we have been told that in the event that the state believes the defendant has opened the door, and we can clarify that later on in some, perhaps some stipulations about what that would look like, then the state would be asking for a 404B hearing at that point with respect to possibilities of it not being a 404, but instead being impeachment. And so, and I wanted to make clear to the court, I am not stipulating to the authenticity or the foundation of the Facebook, the number one and number two 404B acts that the state has noted against Greg McMichael. There are, in my position, there are some significant issues with respect to that, but those don't need to be heard today because this may never come to fruition. While I appreciate Ms. Hood speaking for me, I was actually going to address the court because I do need to address the court on that issue fully. And if the court would like me to do that now, I'd be more than happy to. Let's wait. Let's address it as a matter that would be then before the court. I mean, based on this, I think I understand what's going on. The idea would be, depending on whatever the defense may be, that conversation could go in a different direction, or that argument, I should say, would go in a different direction. This is a matter that I would either, for today, if I could get a stipulation between the parties, great. If not, I'd like to get a little bit more information on where we're going and how it's going to go. Because once we get into the trial of this matter, I would prefer not to stop and to address this issue. So let's flesh it out a little bit further as we move through the motions. Thank you. Let me do this. It's easier for me just to keep it over. From the state, I understand no preliminary matters, no announcements then on the specific motions. No, Your Honor, just that I want to let the court know we do have Mr. John Fowler from the Attorney General's office here to address the disqualification issue and also the motion to strike the appointment issue, which I'm assuming the court may want to take up first based on the nature of those motions. And so we wanted to let you know that. We also filed two motions to quash Defendant Bryan's subpoenas for both Mr. Jesse Evans and for DA Pro Tempore Flynn Brody. So I have both of those. All right. And just to make the court aware, we have eight witnesses we intend to call on the 404B and the mental health issue that we've raised with the state has moved to oppose any evidence on that. Thank you. All right. Anything further then? No, Your Honor. Your Honor, the number one motion is the omnibus motion, which technically addresses the statements of the defendant. Frankly, Ms. Burton, we didn't plan for her to handle that. Also, looking over the pleadings, I think one can argue the notice issues, but I believe, and I'm not sure where the state stands, that the admissibility of Mr. Bryan's statements to the GBI as opposed to the Wayne County Police Department 
those are probably better addressed closer to trial. Your Honor, having spoken with Mr. Goff last night, yesterday, it, I brought to his attention that he had failed to particularize any sort of Jackson v. Deno motion, and I pointed out that there were no custodial statements. Everyone went home after they spoke with the police department. However, Mr. Goff then filed at 4.50 last night an amended omnibus motion seeking to suppress his client's statement <coughs> to GBI agent Seacrest on May 11th of 2020. Um, Mr. Bryan was not in custody and Mr. Goff accompanied him to that particular interview. Um, at this time, the state could go forward tomorrow with agent Seacrest if you so wish to hear this motion. The state's response, of course, is that it's untimely. Any sort of motion to suppress had to have been filed by December 30th per your scheduling order, uh, but we understand that you may still wish to hear it. Of course, we only got notice of it yesterday. We leave it to the discretion of the court whether to hear it tomorrow and or near to trial. And I understand your concern. We would be ready to, to address. I would be ready if directly we can do it tomorrow if the court prefers. Um, but to be fair, we filed a motion at the beginning of this case. I don't recall the state filing a response to it uh, concerning the circumstances under which those statements were made. Uh, and we specifically referenced in there the issue as to the voluntariness of those statements under the state statute. Uh, I don't know how you, how the state could claim that they're prejudiced or unaware that the voluntariness of those statements uh, is an issue. That doesn't, doesn't matter whether he's in custody or not if they're involuntary. That's pretty high standard when you're not in custody, but th that's not the sole question. It's not just an issue of custody. Um, I would rather that Ms. Burton handle the entirety of the omnibus motion. I promised her that she could. Uh, she can't do it tomorrow, but I'm certainly capable of having that hearing tomorrow if the court directs. Um, and I will do as directed by the court. So it's a one witness, Jackson, did Yes, Judge, it is. Yes. Um, well, uh, the trial's not until October. Um, you know, if the state's claiming uh, uh, that the uh, specificity is lacking, I think we now know what it's about. Um, let me think it through. But let's see how the timing goes. Um, if, uh, if we get into tomorrow, I, I may hear it tomorrow then. Uh, that just gives the state enough time to, to work through whatever the issue may be since it's a single witness and we know what the statement is. Uh, so I will put that down at the bottom of the list as far as priorities I'm reaching today. And I'll come back to it to, to make a decision on what I get started. <clears throat> My position on Jackson then I think we just need to hear it on the issues been raised. Um, and so at some point before trial, it's going to be heard. It's just a question of time. Yes, Judge. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so, what I would like to do is uh, the motion to disqualify the court does want to address up front um, as far as the remaining matters, uh, we can probably then work into the 404 beings. We'll have the witnesses. Um, And then get into the state's notice, uh, and then just start working through some of these other matters. Unless anybody has another proposal, that's how the court intends to proceed. Sounds great, yeah. All right. All right. First matter up, then I have um, it's number nine on the amended notice of hearing. The Defendant Mr. Bryan filed a motion to disqualify the prosecutor and for other relief. That was on March 1st of this year. Uh, the state's response. Oh, well, let's see. Let's see. There was also a motion to compel the lawful appointment of the district attorney. There's a second motion to strike the illegal appointment of the district attorney. 
think those are all out. It's just name all those because that's been struck me as all related. Yes, Mr. Goff, your motion. Your Honor, with respect to the motion, the, the second motion to strike the legal appointments, the first motion, of course, already ruled on. Uh, with respect to the second motion to strike the legal appointments, we're going to stand on the argument that it's set forth in our motion. Uh, the legal issues we have addressed to this court before, for the most part, and the court has already entered a ruling. I, I think the court was incorrect, and we certainly can address that if the court wants that. But I'm prepared to stand on the motion that is filed. That's fine, Your Honor. The state will also stand on its response, once again, specifically citing to State versus Mantooth, 337, Georgia Appeals, 698, 2016 case, that of course holds that a criminal defendant has no standing to object to a prosecuting attorney's voluntary refusal and or the AG's appointment of a substitute district attorney pro tempore. And so we ask that you deny his motion. Thank you. Well, God, the motion to compel the lawful appointment of another district attorney. Your Honor, I believe that was done. So, well, an appointment was done. We challenged that appointment, but we, we, we made the original motion. The court notified the attorney general. An appointment was made. That's subject to the second motion to strike. I don't think there's anything to be heard on it. Your Honor, that's uh, correct. The state filed on February 5th, 2021. It is part of the record, the notice of appointment. Uh, at that time, it provided the Georgia Department of Labor, Labor, I'm sorry, the Georgia Department of Laws administrative order by the Attorney General appointing District Attorney Pro Tempore Flynn Brody of the Cobb County <laughs> District Attorney's Office. In addition, the state provided notice um, that Assistant District Attorney Pro Tempore's would be, at that time, Mr. Jesse Evans, myself, Linda Donikoski, and Mr. Norman Barnett. At this time, we also make the announcement to the court that Ms. Larissa Oliveri, who is seated next to me, is also <coughs> an Assistant District Attorney Pro Tempore in this case. Thank you. And uh, just so we track all this, the court had issued to respond today an order um, after the motion had been filed uh, directing the appointment, and that's part of the record. Uh, and that leaves on this issue the first motion to disqualify the prosecutor and four other religions. Well, but before we get to the substance of that motion, there are multiple Brady requests and two motions to quash subpoenas in the case. Uh, I think it would be helpful to address those before we started presenting the evidence. But I'll, obviously, the, the court has to make that determination. Let's go ahead and address those. those I'll call them preliminary matters, but uh, let's go ahead and address the motions to quash the quash evidentiary issues associated with this motion. Yes, Judge. And would you prefer I stand in my place or stand at the podium? Uh, wherever you're most comfortable. All right. As long as the court can hear me. Um, first off, Mr. Goff served mm -hmm. Mr. Jesse Evans um, with a subpoena to come and testify. This was in regard to two issues, both of which do not qualify prima facie on their face for a reason to disqualify the Cobb County District Attorney's Office from this particular case. He, prior to his resignation, which took place uh, April 26th, he is still employed by our office, um, giving us notice, and his last day will be May 28th of this year. However, having resigned, I then was appointed to be lead counsel. Having been former lead counsel, it's inappropriate, number one, to put him on the stand in an effort to disqualify the very office that he was working for. In addition, the two issues are communication and or contact that he had with Greg McMichael five years ago during the Justin Ross Harris hot car death that took place here due to the change in venue out of Cobb County. And the statements he made to a magistrate, magistrate judge who wanted to know in Cobb County how is it that we were able to convene a grand jury down here in Glen in order to indict this case, but we're not doing the same procedure up in Cobb County. Mr. Evans in that transcript, but the state has no problem having the court look at that transcript. Uh, Mr. Evans said what he said in a transcript. 
gave an explanation, and it's based on the Supreme Court of Georgia's guidance on convening grand juries that were issued. So at this time, the state wishes for you to quash the motion or quash the subpoena for Mr. Evans to come in here and testify in an effort to have him explain the inner workings of the district attorney's office's decision to get this particular case indicted during the COVID pandemic per the direction of the Supreme Court of Georgia, and also to have him come in and explain the contact he may or may not have, that he may or may not remember from over five years ago during a trial down here in Glen. Thank you, Your Honor. And that's with regard to Mr. Evans. Mr. Goff, on that issue. Your Honor, I, I, I'm going to start by the, the, the allegation is made in the motion, although not, kindly not repeated today, uh, that the defense uh, and defense counsel uh, has been unprofessional uh, in filing this motion, um, the implication being that there's no good faith basis for pursuing it. Um, and I think it's appropriate to point out that this is not a fishing expedition. It is a motion based on articulable grounds. Uh, particularly in this case, prejudicial comments were spread literally around the world, practically boasting of the improper influence of people associated with the victims in this case over the prosecution of this matter. That is not to say those statements are true. But when those statements are put out there, it raises questions as to the appearance of impropriety, and it's my duty as defense counsel for Mr. Bryan to explore those. Uh, more particularly, we have had statements put out there urging potential jurors to ignore the citizen arrest law because it is unjust. Statements about getting quote unquote justice by quote unquote uh, any means necessary. I, I, at this point, you're on, I'm sorry, I'm going to object none of this. If, I don't know what Mr. Goff is talking about at this point. This first motion to disqualify the prosecutor and for other relief cites to absolutely nothing that he's talking about. And by the way, what he's talking about is well beyond the control of the state of Georgia. It doesn't matter. The question is not whether the actions of independent third parties are beyond the control of the state of Georgia. The question is whether the public statements and actions of independent third parties have reasonably created the appearance of impropriety in, in the Cobb County District Attorney's Office, and either the, the past or the present DA, and hang it, we're focused on the present DA right now. But my point, Your Honor, is when the state comes in and says this is a mere fishing expedition, that there's nothing to be concerned about, I think the court has to look at that in the context of other people have pretty much told the world that they're controlling who prosecutes this case. And that alone, even though the state has no control over it, requires that I pursue that motion and I do so in good faith. And I think that Your Honor, who is the impartial uh, arbiter in this case, uh, I think Your Honor has a duty to explore and to sua sponte, whether there's any appearance of impropriety in this matter. We have, and I'm going to finish, and I'm going to make that proper, uh, that we have the representatives of the victim putting out in social media that the, the appointment of Joyette Holmes and the Cobb County DA's office was, quote, unquote, a huge win for the Arbery family. Boast, uh, another person associated with that, boasting about spending half a million dollars to have these men, quote, unquote, held accountable boasting that they, de quote unquote, devised a strategy to get these men. Now, you combine those, those facts, which I don't think the state disputes, they just dispute, dispute that they have control over them, okay? But you combine that with the allegations in the motion, which are talking about a campaign website, specifically attacking the prior district attorney for, and her office for having a conflict in this case and for making other statements about this case, and at the same time, openly campaigning for the current president, I think the current president of the United States, Joseph Biden, and Kamala Harris, and the entire ticket, all these just outrageously partisan statements, and interspersing my client's case in the middle of all of it. Now, why do we need Brady responses? Why do we need testimony? Because the state has stonewalled this entire time, and we, what we find on social media doesn't mean it's all that's there. What videos and other statements that we find, I would respectfully submit, we believe we found the tip of the iceberg. 
that there's all kinds of stuff going on in Cobb County that we have no way uh, of, of verifying on our own. All kinds of things are happening up in, in, in the Capitol. The only way that we can get to that information, and I think the, the, the information that's out there certainly provides a good faith basis for doing so. The only way to access that information is to require the district attorney's office to produce the evidence that is within their control, within the meaning of Brady v. Maryland, and putting up the only people that actually are likely to have that knowledge. I mean, let's be clear. The odds that Linda Dunikowski, the, the state's prosecutor, now head prosecutor handling this case, that she was necessarily involved in conversations between Flynn Brody and the President of the United States? Maybe, but I, I'm guessing not. Any of those kinds of, if, if there were communications between Lee Merritt and Sean King or Ben Crump and, and state officials, it is unlikely that Ms. Gunnikowski would have knowledge of that. I'm doubtful that Mr. Evans would have knowledge of that. The only people within those offices likely to have knowledge of such sensitive things would be the, the current elected district attorney and the former district, uh, former district attorney. Obviously, the former district attorney having stepped aside, I can't disqualify somebody who's already out of the case. But still, the state has an obligation not to simply say, well, you found a website, you found a town hall video, you found a bunch of social media posts that our boss made, but we, that, that doesn't provide any reason to question what's been going on here, and we don't have to disclose information that we have possession or custody of control over that would suggest that our office has a, developed an interest in this case. It's not simply a conflict question with Mr. McMichael. Does Flynn Brody and the Cobb County District Attorney's Office, have, have they developed a personal interest in this case? Whatever the court decides about Greg McMichael and his relationship and the dis Brunswick District Attorney's Office to the Cobb County DA's office, whatever the court decides, Mr. Brody, having inserted this case into his campaign for district attorney multiple times, and it, once he's done that, you can't come back and say, I was just kidding. It's just, uh, as the district attorney says, campaign rhetoric. And we're certainly entitled to know if there's more to this than we have been able to discover. And that's what the Brady request is for. It's one thing to say that they don't have the information, that it's beyond their control. It's a different matter to say it doesn't exist. And it's still a third entirely different matter to say it's not relevant. And if there's any question, as I stated in my motion, I think the appropriate thing to do would be for the state to submit all of the information that's subject to the, that, that they have possession, custody, or control over access to, including the private, privately maintained emails, phone calls, etc. All of that information can be submitted to this court in camera, and then this court can make an in-camera inspection of all that information and decide what we're entitled to under Brady v. Maryland, because ultimately, that is the remedy. It's for the court to conduct the, the, the inspection. Uh, it, and that's a way of addressing this in this case. I'm not trying to embarrass Flynn Brody or Joy F. Holmes or Jesse Evans or anybody else. I'm just doing my job for my client. If the court reviews the information we've requested and the court says that there's nothing there, it'll be placed you know, under seal in the file and it can be addressed on appeal. Thank you. Okay. The uh, <clears throat> topic we were on was the motion to quash. The uh, former lead counsel in this case, Jesse Evans, uh, having heard the arguments uh, of counsel, uh, the motion to quash uh, the subpoena of Jesse Evans is, is granted. Um, the court's not going to compel the former lead prosecutor to testify in this case. The standard for doing so has not been satisfied by the defendant and by the uh, defense counsel's uh, words. He probably wouldn't be the witness that would be appropriate before the court anyway. And therefore, Your Honor, we now move to the state's motion to quash the subpoena and brief in support of that I filed on May 10th for the subpoena given to uh, District Attorney Pro Tempore Flynn Brody. That required his attendance. He, of course, is here, would be anyways. Um, but for him to testify would be inappropriate. Once again, he is the elected official of Cobb County. He is the manager of this prosecution and this prosecution team. And for him to have to testify or bring with him the defendant's request for all electronic communication from 2011 
to present, if any, between defendant Brian's co-defendant, Greg McMichael, and anyone within the Cobb County District Attorney's Office is incredibly burdensome uh, in this matter. Right now, the people who probably or may have had any electronic communication with Greg McMichael have left the Cobb County District Attorney's Office. We have no access, meaning the prosecution team, to their closed email accounts. It would take the Cobb County IT Department to see if they could even get this information, and I don't even know what kind of search they would be able to do to discover this. I will state in my place that I am the appellate attorney on the Justin Ross Harris case, and thus having reviewed the file, found no communications in that particular file between anyone at the Cobb County District Attorney's Office and Greg McMichael. Therefore, to have Mr. Brody, who was not the DA during that period of time, having been elected last November and taken office this January 2021, to testify to matters he has no knowledge of or to bring into court matters that he has no knowledge of and, by the way, is incapable of bringing or presenting at this time, we ask that you quash that subpoena for the Greg McMichael communications as it is burdensome. In addition, once again, the defense has failed to breach the threshold of anything that would disqualify Flynn Brody um, from being the district attorney pro tempore due to any campaign rhetoric that may or may not have been on his website. The two things defense cites to, defendant Brian cites to, are a post that is obviously erroneous on his website, saying that Joyette Holmes had a relationship with Greg McMichael. Obviously, it was Jesse Evans who had a business, minor business relationship with Greg McMichael five years ago during the Justin Ross Harris case. So while it was on a web page, it was erroneous. That does not breach any sort of threshold for disqualification due to an interest in this case. <coughs> to put Mr. Brody on the stand to ask him about his campaign and everything that he did, um, because of course politicians advocate, I should be the better candidate, I'm the better DA, they are of course going to attack their opponent by pointing out how they're a better candidate. We also have a YouTube video that of course is not in possession of the district attorney's office and therefore, given that those are the only things Mr. Bryan has proposed, the state will state in its place. We understand our Brady obligations. We understand them fully. If there was a reason for us to be disqualified, we would go ahead and provide that to the court and to Mr. Bryan. At this time, there's no reason to disqualify Flynn Brody or the Cobb County District Attorney's Office as the district attorney pro tempore. And Mr. Bryan has not even breached the threshold or made a prima facie case with any of this that would call for disqualification. Therefore, we ask for you to quash the subpoena. Thank you. Your Honor, I assume their motion to quash the subpoena encompasses the subpoena due to the team issued to Mr. Frost. Sounds like that's what she was arguing. I think so. Your Honor, we're entitled to have any information that would reasonably call into question whether the Cobb County District Attorney's Office should be handling this case. If there's any question as to whether he has developed, Mr. Roddy has developed a personal interest in this case, whether when he was a candidate or subsequently, it, it is appropriate. It's also appropriate to inquire as to whether there's any basis uh, to believe that there's a relationship between the Cobb County District Attorney's Office and, and Mr. McMichael, directly or indirectly through the Brunswick District Attorney's Office. Now, I understand the difficulty of the state responding to the multiple Brady requests and to the subpoena. But let's be clear. These requests have been, have been filed from the outset of this case. The state has had ample time uh, to address these issues. Now, the state wants to present this as it's only a matter of Greg McMichael. Greg McMichael is related to a lot of other people in the Brunswick DA's office that have ties to the, to the Cobb County DA's office, they're referenced in the, in, in the exhibits that, that will be tendered, uh, including another assistant from the office uh, that they hire in the sex crimes division. And around the same time, suddenly Mr. Brown was, was being, there are allegations thrown about uh, that he somehow was being investigated for sex crimes. Maybe it's just a coincidence. I don't know. But the only way that we can really get to the bottom of it is for them to comply with the Brady motions in the manner I've previously discussed with respect to the previous motion. Uh, or in response to the subpoena. I would note, Your Honor, they're presenting this as if it's just one case, and it's not. Uh, the, the Brunswick District Attorney's Office was involved 
uh, with the Cobb County District Attorney's Office in the prosecution of DeMarquis Elkins, a Brunswick case that was transferred to Marietta for Cobb County. I know that because I was lead counsel in that case as circuit public defender. And I know that Mr. McMichael was involved in the case. And I'm almost certain, almost certain, that he was issued a Cobb County District Attorney's Office identification badge at that time. For all we know, that identification badge is still valid as we speak here today. Um, and I don't doubt that Ms. Dunikowski may be unaware of it, but the state is the state. Any knowledge of anybody in their office is attributable to them. And to say that just because someone left the office that there's no longer any connections, it's wrong, Your Honor. They can claim that there's no appearance of impropriety, but Your Honor has a duty to uphold the integrity of this process. And when you see articles being published in the Atlanta Journal-Constitution and other places where people who are completely uninvolved in this case, legal scholars, but completely uninvolved in this case, openly question from day one the ties between the Brunswick office and the Cobb County office, it does raise the suggestion that the only reason the Cobb County office has this case is because it was acceptable to the Arbery family. And we're entitled to know what assurances or promises were made behind closed doors that suddenly made that okay. They need to respond to the Brady motions. They need to respond to the subpoena ducis tecum. Uh, if they want to submit uh, documents responsive to the subpoena ducis tecum to the court for an in-camera inspection, we're okay with that too. But the only, if they're not going to provide any of that information, the only way that we can get to it is through witness testimony. And, and then they don't want to allow us to call the only witnesses who might actually have personal knowledge uh, of the relevant facts and circumstances. In other words, we can file uh, any motion we like, we just can't develop or present or have the court hear the evidence on it. And, and I believe that this court uh, is well aware of the unusual nature of this case. I've never been involved in a case before where we've had three separate laws adopted since this case started, which are almost directly attributable, or if not directed to this case. We have a new citizen arrest statute. We have a hate crime statute. And now we have a change of venue law that seems unlikely to apply to very many, if any other cases in the state of Georgia, other than this one. So we have all these statements from all these elected officials about, about this case and about these cases around the country. And, and to say, given Mr. Brody's actions as a candidate and given the, the, the relationship, these are important issues. And while everybody knows that Greg McMichael had dealings with the Cobb County DA's office, unless we can get witness testimony or production of evidence how do we go beyond the statements thrown out to the AJC and other places that they, they don't feel there's a conflict? We have the right to contest those statements. And that's what we're asking the court to allow us to do today. And if we can't present witness testimony from the only people associated with the prosecution who are likely to have that evidence, then, then we're going to go proceed with this motion with, with one hand tied behind our backs. And that's not due process. <clears throat> the um, Mr. Coffey, the way this motion has been presented to the court today, it, it, it. an adult in Texas. May I speak to the court as I move around? Okay. okay. If anybody has a problem with hearing, then just let me know. So again, uh, I understand that the goose next go actually in the speakers. We also will be addressing at some point today the state's request to prevent the defense from going into history of mental illness of, of Mr. Arbery. Some of these witnesses and what they'll be talking about, the events of what happened, have some details within them that fit within the relevance of this mental illness. So I just want to make you aware that what I'm showing the court at this moment is a timeline that we have become aware of through the exchange of discovery with the state. And the state has made us aware 
of several witnesses was being to maybe use of those working at some of the local businesses around the community who have had interaction with Mr. Arbery. Those witnesses being, uh, those witnesses being part of the Department of Community Services and Probation and those witnesses being other officers in the community who have had cause to come into contact with Mr. Arbery. All that we are talking with the court about when it comes to 404B are other acts where that rule of evidence says other acts may be relevant if we can demonstrate 401, why we're admitting it, because we're certainly not admitting it for bad character, and so 401 says if there is another reason other than bad character, then you satisfy that part of the inquiry, and then we move into 403. So what we have learned is that Mr. Arbery, starting back and moving 2017, 2018, and 2018, and into 2020, had a pattern of conduct and behavior had a pattern of other acts that included theft crimes or attempted burglary crimes or when confronted about his actions by people who appeared to have some authority, whether it be a business owner or a neighbor or the police or the Department of Corrections or even his mom, when confronted about his act that was under question, his response to that is to get angry and aggressive, physically and verbally. And so for purposes of this part of why we're offering this, we believe that this 404B evidence will speak to several issues that are inherently locked within this case that cannot be removed from the case because they are so fundamental to the issue. So what we're speaking about, Your Honor, is the very basic facts of that Mr. Arbery was in a neighborhood on February 23rd, 2020, that he did not live in, that Mr. Arbery was in a house in that neighborhood that he does not own and had been in that house on several occasions at night over the course of several months, that Mr. Arbery is running away after being seen. And what I'm, what I'm giving you, Your Honor, is the acts that are inherently part of the trial of this case. We are not limited to the elements of what's being charged, but the issues that this case involves. And so these acts that we have that are uncontroverted, being in the neighborhood, being in the house, running away after being seen, and multiple attempts to detain Mr. Arbery with verbal, either verbal commands or, or words, trying to engage him to detain him, and then his behavior and his reaction to that with the McMichaels, and Mr. Arbery's decision to then ultimately engage in physical assaultive conduct. These are all the issues that need to be determined and that we believe will be in the minds of the jurors. What was going on that day? Why was it going on? And what was everyone's intent? What was the motivation of these people? These people being Mr. Arbery and the McMichaels. Because those issues are central to the case, we feel that the evidence that we'll be presenting today is original evidence that needs to be presented to aid the jury in deciding these issues. So for example, what was, was, were the thoughts reasonable? I'm not sure what that is, Your Honor, I'll pause. Okay. Were the actions of the the parties, Mr. Arbery and, and the McMichaels, were they reasonable? Were the McMichaels' interpretations of conduct and behavior of what they observed about Mr. Arbery, was that reasonable? Were they allowed under the law to detain Mr. Arbery? 
Why did they bring firearms? Why did they seek to arrest or perform a citizen's arrest? Why did they feel they needed to defend themselves in the process? And what the court is going to be tasked with doing and what the jury is going to be tasked with doing is looking at all these actions in hindsight to determine whether or not the law applies in the way that the sides will be arguing. And so that's why the evidence I'm going to present is relevant because it's going to help to determine what was going on with Mr. Arbery that day. So if we, if we look at 404B, we're offering the 404B evidence for Mr. Arbery to show in this case, 404B allows us to deal with other acts that happened in the past that the McMichaels were unaware of but that aid the jury in determining what the intent and motive of Mr. Arbery was on that day. Because his intent and his motive is something that is central to the case. And we feel the 404B evidence will help answer those questions. And just as a preliminary, I haven't asked Ms. Dunikowski her thoughts about this, but perhaps I'll say to the court, we're happy to ultimately brief this issue to your honor. We can argue some cases today if that would please your, the court, but this is something that I think we may be briefing if, if the court wants that. But ultimately, the law says, as we see it many times in 404B evidence against a defendant, where they bring in the past acts to show the intent or the motive or the plan or the scheme of the defendant went on trial, none of which the witnesses in the case know about, none of which the alleged victims in those cases know about, but it's brought in to inform the jury so that the jury can determine the issues that are central in the case. What we have also, Your Honor, is this other idea that not only should this be allowed for original evidence, but we also think the door has been opened, essentially, when we talk about the facts of the case that the state has and the court has and the filings have and the testimony at the preliminary hearing, as well as the bond motion, has established that the state feels these central issues and questions are relevant to the determination of the issue as well. So as I'll point out with this particular board, Your Honor, we have a lot of statements by state witnesses and a lot of statements by the state answering the question of why Ahmaud Arbery was in the neighborhood that day answering the question, did the defendants commit crimes, answering the question why there was a chase. So I just say this to Your Honor, that the evidence that we're going to present today, I would like for Your Honor to consider it in the context of what I'm doing this little opening for. Understood. Thank you, Judge. All right, so we'll call our first witness. I've had a mistake before we do this. Oh, sure. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, Your Honors. Yes, please. Okay. Feel free to leave that up there. The state has not seen either of these exhibits, so I am going to take a moment to look at them. I wasn't given the opportunity to review these at any point in time, nor were they served on the state. And, Your Honor, just to respond, we're not admitting these in the record. No, no. So just from this point forward, though, if anyone's going to use anything in the courtroom, let's make sure, at least before the proceeding starts, it doesn't necessarily need to be produced in discovery. Sure. If it's going to be used at a hearing, make sure the other side's seen it so that we don't have any moments of wasted time. Very good. Thank you, Your Honor. Based solely on 
the defendant's opening statement, they have failed to meet any threshold requirement for 404B evidence at all. They asserted that the 404B evidence of Ahmad, Ar Ahmad Arbery's prior crimes and other acts would speak to issues in this case. And they said that the motivation of the victim is the central issue in this case. Your Honor, they have put us on notice that this is a self-defense case. First off, in a self-defense case, you cannot start it. If you're the first aggressor, you cannot go ahead and murder somebody. They, you can't claim self-defense if you started it. They started this when Greg McMichael saw Ahmad Arbery running down the street. They had no knowledge that he had been inside 220 Satilla Shores earlier, just moments earlier. They had no knowledge of that. It's common sense, fight or flight. And what Mr. Ahmad Arbery did was he fled because he was under no legal obligation whatsoever to stop and talk to strangers who were trying to hit him with their pickup trucks and shoot him with their shotguns. They just basically said that Ahmad Arbery's decision and his conduct is what this case is about. That is bad character evidence. That is propensity evidence. So they haven't even met the threshold in their opening statement. They then said, were Mr. Arbery's thoughts reasonable? It doesn't matter what Mr. Arbery was thinking whatsoever. Were his actions reasonable? It doesn't matter what his actions were. He was running away from these men. The defendant's interpretation of his actions, well, if they want to take the stand and talk about that, they're entitled to. They did talk about it in their statements. Once again, defense counsel just said they were trying to detain Mr. Arbery. The question of why they brought firearms has nothing to do whatsoever with any of this. They didn't know Mr. Arbery. They made a choice to go get their firearms. But Greg McMichael also made the choice not to bother to bring his cell phone. What did they feel in order to need to defend themselves? That's nothing to do with Mr. Arbery whatsoever. Their baseline is that the jury is entitled, for some reason, to determine what was going on with the victim. Not at all. Not relevant. What's going on with the victim has absolutely nothing to do with the fact that he was running down a public street in the United States of America when two people decided to get guns and try and hit him with their pickup trucks, joined by Mr. Bryan, who then actually hit him with the pickup truck. They then cornered him like a rat, according to their statements, held him. So how is his prior acts that they knew nothing about relevant to any issue in this case? Because if this is a self-defense case, it's the reasonableness of their actions. If they're the first aggressors, they have a problem. So now it's, well, was it reasonable for us to do a citizen's arrest? They weren't making a citizen's arrest. According to their own counsel, they were seeking to detain, falsely imprison, another American unlawfully. The jury does not need any of this in order to answer any of these questions. And to claim that the state feels something, I appreciate all the defense attorneys speaking for me today. But no, the state does not feel that these are essential questions. The state is going to put up its case. The state is going to prove them guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. And none of these 404B other acts by Mr. Ahmad Arbery are relevant to that. Thank you. All right. Mr. Sheffield, your answer. Yes, thank you. We call Chief Rod Ellington. Dallas, excuse me. I'm keeping it up for me and so that I can keep the timeline relevant to the court. State would object. <laughs> What's the objection? Your witness is looking at your board to track whatever's going on. So I don't have any problem with you referring to it, but you just turn it away from the witness. 
this. So I know the witness isn't testifying on the things that he contained. Sure. You just want me to take it down? Do you solemnly swear or affirm the testimony you shall give to the court? Shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth to help you God? I do. Go ahead, Chief. Chief Ellis, I'm Jason Sheffield. Good morning. With the court's permission, if Chief Ellis would like to remove his mask, may he? Uh, yes. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Chief Ellis, if you'll just give us your full name, please. Rodney Ellis. And where are you employed? I'm the Chief of Police and the School Safety Coordinator for the Glen County School District in Brunswick, Georgia. Okay. And where were you employed back in December 3rd, 2013? I was the Chief of Police for the school system here in Glen County, Georgia. Okay. I want to direct your attention back to that day in particular and an incident that I believe you were involved in. Do you recall being involved in the arrest of Mr. Ahmad Arbery back on December 3rd, 2013? I do. Where did that take place? Brunswick High School. And what was going on at that time at the high school? We were having a basketball game, uh, night game, um, and one of my lieutenants observed a, fi a firearm in his waistband. Okay. How many officers? I'm sorry? Go ahead. I'm sorry. Your, your complete answer was one of your lieutenants observed. One of my lieutenants observed a firearm in, his, in, in the waistband of Mr. Arbery. Where did the, now in terms of this arrest, mm -hmm. were you there in a part and participated in Mr. Arbery's arrest? Yes. Okay. How many other officers were involved? I would have to, to look at my notes to see exactly, but there were a number of officers that were involved. There's a number of reports that were written that night, but there was a, a contingent of officers there you know, to work in that ball game. We generally have about eight officers there at those games. And did you oversee the arrest and the reports and, and approve all the reports in that case? I did. Okay. What was it that first drew the officer's attention to Mr. Arbery? As I understand it to be, as it's written in his report. Objection. I, I learned, I learned uh, basically. Uh, objection. Um, hearsay. Right. Hey, Judge, for, the, for our purposes here, my burden is to demonstrate to the court that we have a real event that's occurred and that through preponderance, I would be able to satisfy that burden. This being the chief of police and who oversaw all the officers that night and was present, I, I'm simply offering this to explain to the court what happened and why decisions were made and what was observed. All right. Uh, of course, you're good. for the purposes of this here, yes, sir. 404B, again, with respect, depending on the court's ruling, right. uh, if in fact this evidence was to be presented at trial, it would be, uh, it may be new difficult. I understand, Your Honor. We, we, would have all the witnesses to speak specifically about what they did on that evening, but we thought for purposes of this hearing only that we would present this evidence in this fashion. Okay. okay. You may go ahead and answer the question. Please repeat your question. Sure. Clarity. What was the first thing that occurred that alerted the officers to Mr. Arbery? I learned over the radio via emergency radio traffic that there was a person that had been observed having a gun in his waistband inside the ball game by one of the officers that was at one of the front entrances there. Okay. Was anything said to Mr. Arbery about that gun in his waistband? I learned over the radio that there was an individual that had been uh, observed with a gun, was given his description, uh, and was advised over the radio, I learned over the radio, that he had exited the gym and was running away. <laughs> Do you know, and I think the court has So I think the court is going to permit you to talk about what you heard on that day to sort of simplify the presentation of this evidence to the court. So you can say that what you learned and, and feel free to discuss it. Okay. Okay. So you learned, did, did any of the officers say anything to Mr. Arbery when they saw the gun? The lieutenant challenged him at, at the door and said, you know, stop, I need to talk to you. And at that point in time, he ran out the door, okay. ran away from the officer, refused to comply with the officer's command to stop, I need to talk to you, uh, ran out the door, um, and ran away from multiple officers there until he got to my position where I tried to apprehend him as well. Okay. 
did any of the officers try to put their hands on him or to physically restrain him? Yes. And what did Mr. Arbery do as a result of that? He resisted. He ran and, and swapped their hands away and ran. One did, did any of the officers get injured? One of the officers was chasing him and fell, yes. Okay. But no other physical signs of injury or scratches or anything like that? No. Okay. And once he ran, did other officers join in the chase of Mr. Arbery? Yes. Are you aware if any other officers gave him commands to stop or that they wanted to speak to him at that time? Yes. Who, who did and what did they say? I was, was more than just likely the second one who, who the officers that, that made contact with him initially, I'm, I'm certain based upon the reports told him to stop, that he made contact with, that he went past. When he got to my position, one of my now lieutenants was behind him and radioed me and gave me a description and said, that's the guy they're after that's running by your vehicle. I proceeded to give chase, roll the window down on my vehicle, began to yell at him very loudly with loud verbal commands to stop police. I was on a marked patrol car, patrol SUV. I ran alongside of him. He ran parallel to my vehicle. The, the old Brunswick High School where this took place in no longer exist. But there was a breezeway out in front of that school, and he was running along that, that breezeway. Let me uh, stop you there. At any point when you were giving him the commands to stop, did he stop? No. Okay. And continue, please. He was running along, and I was, was advised he was potentially armed. Um, and my lieutenant, who also was, was running behind me, uh, had his weapon out. Um, I screamed as loud as I could, stop, stop, stop fearing he was still armed, because that's what I, the information that I had. I had, you know, my weapon out the window, trained on him, you know, begging him, yelling, stop, stop, stop. And as he ran, he slowed down, he made eye contact with me, he began to pat his waistband. And... When he did that, what were your thoughts? Lord, please don't let me have to shoot this man. Okay. And he... The elements were certainly there to have used deadly force in that situation. Um, I was praying I would not have to. Um, he came up empty-handed as he was patting his waistband. He didn't have anything in his hands. Um, the, the lighting was not very good there. But when, his hand, when he came up with his hands, he kind of made eye contact with me again. And at that point in time, he began to run again, accelerating away. So at that point in time, he went around the corner and I continued to pursue him. Ultimately, did he stop? He stopped when he ran around a corner away from me. He was running from me and he ran right straight into two of my officers who took him into custody. And then I exited my vehicle and we all three of us got him handcuffed. Did they report to you how he stopped at that moment and took him into custody? Did he comply? They took him, they took him into custody at gunpoint. They did. Did they have any physical altercation? He didn't fight at that point in time. He, he okay. gave up. He relented and mm -hmm. yes, stopped. He, he, okay. he, did not, he did not resist at that point in time. Did you observe anything about him that you thought, under the circumstances, was abnormal? Well, other than bringing a, a gun to a, to a high school event, that certainly was unlawful and, and, and abnormal, causing us, us great concern as to, to why that took place. Um, no one else in a marked patrol car um, yelling at him please to stop screaming at him you know, at, at the top of my lungs you know as best I could to tell him to stop um, and he would you know, refuse to comply with those commands and what the scary part of that for me was was re reaching for the waistband I understand he was ultimately arrested yes for what he was arrested for carrying weapon on school property um, and disrupting, because we had to lock down the event. We had to actually lock down the gymnasium, you know, um, as that was going on, which caused a disruption there. Uh, the game continued, but it certainly it caused a, a buzz there um, amongst the participants and a great deal of anxiety amongst the people that were there. Um, the, he was also charged with, uh, with that. He was also charged with uh, resisting a lawful uh, resisting lawful law enforcement officer with violence. Maybe obstruction? That's correct, obstruction okay. violence. At the time when he was being arrested, when, he, when the officers and he had stopped running, did he say anything at that time? We asked him, where's, where's the gun? 
He said, at that point in time, we, we patted him down and couldn't find a gun. Um, he said, I, I don't know, I must have dropped it. Okay. And did he say anything else about why he ran? He didn't. Okay. Did he do anything at that moment or behave in any way that you thought was abnormal in terms of connecting with you and talking with you? Not really at that point in time. He had, he had res resigned himself, to, uh, you know, he appeared to me to resign himself to the fact that he was apprehended and there was no point in resisting or running or anything at that point in do, time. do you know whether or not he ultimately resolved his case with a, a guilty plea? He did, and I'm not sure of the, that the, the, that was spent several years ago. I knew it was, it was, there was a plea, plea bargain in the case. I'm not sure exactly how it was adjudicated. Okay. I do know we never, I don't recall ever going to a, a court hearing on it. All right. One moment, please. No further questions. Mr. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Judge. Good morning, Chief Ellis. How are you? Good morning. How are you, ma'am? Good. Thanks. So, you said you were in a marked patrol car. Is that right? That is accurate. All right. And how were you dressed at that time? I was in a, a, a Class B uniform, um, a polo shirt, khaki pants, uh, Glen County School District Police. I was identifiable okay. as a law enforcement officer. So anybody who saw you would know that you were, in fact, and indeed, a law enforcement officer. That is correct. Okay. You mentioned someone running behind you. This was your lieutenant? That's accurate. All right. How was he dressed? The same. All right. So in identifiable uniform? That is correct. The two officers that Mr. Arbery ran into when he ran around the corner that apprehended him at gunpoint, how were they dressed? The same. Everybody's in law enforcement uniforms? Yes, ma'am. Easily identifiable? Yes, ma'am. As law enforcement? That's correct. Okay. Were there other marked patrol cars out there? Yes. And the person who first noted that Mr. Arbery had this firearm on him when he was going into the gym, was that also a law enforcement officer? Yes, ma'am. How was that law enforcement officer dressed? The same. And do you recall that in this case, the weapon was actually found at the front of the gym? That is accurate. Okay, so he, kind of, he dropped it right away as he ran, right? Appears so. Okay, because obviously he didn't have it on him when you arrested him. Is that correct? That's accurate. All right. And then in this particular case, he was charged with three counts of obstruction. Is that right? Do you remember that? I'd have to refer to see exactly how many counts. Yes, ma'am. I don't know he was, he was charged with that offense. Does it sound familiar that he was charged with obstruction for Ron Harris by knocking Officer Harris to the ground? Is that correct? Yes, yes ma'am. That would, that, would, that would be an accurate statement, I would think. Okay. Now, is Mr. Ron Harris the one who tripped over the uh, speed bump and fell down during the chase? Ron did fall, yes ma'am, I was injured, um, had to be you know, checked out at the hospital and, and was on light duty for several days after that, pretty scratched up. Okay, and then we also have Officer David Smith, whose arm was scratched. That's accurate. Okay, and then we have obstruction for you by failing to comply with uh, your lawful commands to stop running. That's accurate. All right, and do you recall that Mr. Arbery then pled guilty to those charges and received misdemeanor sentences on all of those instruction charges. Ma'am, again, that's been so many years. I knew it was adjudicated. I knew the matter was handled, uh, but I'm not. I couldn't testify to exactly what those circumstances are. I'd have to look at the record, the record to see how that would reflect. But I knew, I knew it was handled, and it was, it was a, a adjudicated issue. Okay, and I just want to make sure this was December 3rd of 2013. Is that correct? That is accurate. Yes, ma'am. And at the time of this particular incident, to your knowledge, was Mr. Bryan, who's seated right here in the white shirt, was he present? Go ahead, stand up and help stand up. Uh, I, I don't, I couldn't testify if he was or not. Okay, so you don't know him or 
You don't, he wasn't part of the law enforcement contingent, was he? No. <coughs> okay. And do you know who Greg McMichael is? Yes, ma'am. All right. Was he present then? No, ma'am. Not that I recall. Okay. And his son, Travis McMichael, to your knowledge, was he present? No, ma'am. Not that I recall. I will pass the witness. Just briefly. Chief Ellis, you had said you don't recall and you couldn't remember and might look at your reports. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? Yes. I'm just going to show you this document and see if it refreshes your memory. I'll show it to the Hudson Council. I'm not marking it. If you'll take a look here, she was asking you questions about. Okay, this is the, this is the uh, is that disposition. Refresh, no, leave, does that refresh your memory about the disposition of the case? Sure. Okay. And did he resolve that? I'm taking the document back. Did he resolve that with the felony plea by his probation? I have to look back at that document and see again. Okay. Now pose your question to me again, please. Yeah. You were just being asked about how he resolved it. I think the state had asked you on cross that he, in fact, resolved it with misdemeanor offenses, but did he resolve it with a felony plea to possession of fire? According to your document, which will be the most accurate record, not my memory, but this. Well, if it refreshes your memory. It says the disposition, guilty. Carrying a weapon on school. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And just, just if you'll just look at it, Chief Ellis, and mm -hmm. just see if that refreshes your memory. Yeah. If it does not, that's okay. If it does, then you simply can test Non jury negotiated. I'm not going to read the verbatim, right. Judge, but just five years. Uh, well, 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 sir. You can't read it out loud. Okay, sir. So if the question I need to pose to you based on all the okay. evidence is okay. after having looked at that document, mm -hmm. does it refresh your memory about whether or not Mr. Arbery? Enter a guilty plea that carried five years of probation for carrying a firearm. According to this document, that's accurate. And, sir, I've noted here on this board, you did not help me create this, did you? No, sir. Okay, but I've noted up here that he had an arrest charge, of, a gun charge, and obstruction back in 2013. Does that accurately reflect essentially what you're testifying here to? Yes, sir. Okay. Nothing further, Your Honor. Anything else? Briefly. Mr. Sheffield. Oh, yes. May I? Oh, sure. Thank you. So, is my approach wrong? Right? Good. Using the same document? Mr. Yes, ma'am. Just showed you. Mm -hmm. All right. Does this refresh your recollection on counts three, four, and five, the obstruction charges that Mr. Arbery pled guilty to a misdemeanor? Ma'am, I don't see defense to me or felony anywhere on this page. I know those offenses or felonies. Um, the, at least uh, one of them is high and aggravated. The other two are, are felonies. I don't know what the disposition as far as if it was bargained down to a misdemeanor. So the sentence of only 12 months as opposed to a felony which would be one year or above, is that an indication to you here that he only received 12 months on the obstruction charges? On the obstruction charges, on the carrying a weapon to the school ground, it says five years probation. Correct. So I'm asking about the obstruction, um, not about the gun charge, but about the obstruction. It says 12 months sentence on your document there. And you know that to be misdemeanor sentencing, correct? I don't know that, ma'am. Nothing further. Maybe excused. Oh, do you have anything further? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Thank you, Judge. I didn't mean to interpret your return to the council table. Thank you, Chief. You missed up there. Yes, thank you. Sir. Mr. Shepard. Yes. Uh, we can take a five minute recess. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, five minutes. We'll come back on just before the top of the hour.